Nothing is profane. Therefore, what hangs at first light in a river's mist what infuses every wisp of cloud. What animates the frenetic dance of waterfalls. What possesses every mountain? What throbs in the heart of every beast, every fish is sacred. Such faith is the spirit's lifeblood coursing deep into the body of this land, flowing through the uncounted generations of Columbia River Indian people who have lived here since time immemorial. Far back as none of us can remember, but our forefathers hereditarily had related the stories since the time of beginning, how important the resources of this country are, and it has been passed down generation to generation of our customs, in our ways of life, in our own way of understanding and interpreting what is important to our people. At the beginning in the time of creation, as we have been taught by our elders, not of their own teaching, but by the Creator's laws, all of the things of creation take their place and have an order. The time to the Creator is very insignificant, that, uh, as one of the songs say, He knows our every breath, but then He also has no time. I don't know which, which would be a creation of the heaven and earth in seven days and uh, the creation of heaven and earth in several billion years. The Creator created everything on this earth in legends prior to the Creator's way of making this land and the landscape. The water became the body of this land before the land became the body. The Creator had set monumental landmarks. the mountains and fed the mountains with water to flow downstream to nourish the life of this earth. When the land was formulated into like a mat for us to stand on and to live on and it enumerated resources by numbers and by names and purpose of the resources. When the Creator, our God, created heaven and earth, He also created the creatures of this earth and the human He left in charge to take care of and care for everything He had created here, all the resources we have. And in 
this plan, he also included that the food should be provided for his people and that the salmon of the waters and the roots that he planted in the fields and the berries in the mountains were to provide the livelihood for these people who are to care for his country. And all of the things that go along with the order of creation, from then the water and all the plants and all the things that bloom on the land, and then to all the animal kingdom. And thereupon the salmon takes its rightful place as the first food in that order of creation and behind it all of the other foods line up. When I was old enough to notice things, when I was growing up, I began to observe what my ancestors, the elders in my family were doing. When I reached that age of eight years old, I noticed people not just my family, but other people were busy, always busy gathering food of all kinds. Their food was very important to them because it was felt that this food was medicine to your body. It takes out all the poisons out of our body. It purifies us, renews our body, just like the new food renews itself. It was created for that purpose. Now I'm old, and I've been taught that all of these things are holy, that they were created for a purpose, to take care of us as people. And we have our religion that was preserved for us by our elders, our way of life. and. In, with our religion, we were taught that our salmon and our meat and our roots and berries are gifts from the Creator Himself, that He blessed us that way. And it's with our religion that we have to learn to take care of Him and let Him know how much you know, they mean to us, what He's done for us. It's our way of life, you know, totally. We have to carry on our traditions, our religion, in worshiping and protecting and praying for those salmon, carry on our services so that those salmon will come back. That's our responsibility uh, to these salmon. In order for them to come back, we have to uh, maintain our culture and remember where we came from. Salmon was presented to me and my family through our religion as our brother. Um, the same with the the deer and our sisters are the roots and the berries and you would treat them as much their life is just as valuable to you as another person would be and uh, you treat them with that respect for their life and in return they're going to treat you the same with your life that's the way i was told you know I have it's it's faith it's a faith that um I believe in, and it's a faith that I try to instill into my children that, um, that can't go away. There's no way out of it. You know, it's a way of life. Salmon is, uh, is the giver of life to the Indian people, it gives us strength. It doesn't give us give sickness or pain uh, when it's prepared properly. And then, and then it gives us strength to get from here to the other world. Yeah. That's how important salmon is. Yeah. As the land laid and our people exercised the ways of taken the resources and using it for their livelihood, for survival. It continued to generations and generations for thousands of years. Our body and blood flowed together and the life was provided by the resources to continue living. For generations, 
We have carried the teachings for thousands of years, our way of life and our livelihood. We are those descendants, have lived those teachings. We still hear the words of our forefathers, their voice is clear in our minds. As an Indian person, I cannot own the salmon. I can share it with other things, but I cannot own it. Fishing to me and my family is a way of life more than it is a livelihood. You know, it was something that was handed down to us and preserved by our elders. And we try to continue to practice that. We do as much of preserving the fish as it was in the past as we do selling it. You know, we try to balance it that way. The reason I've been fishing is more for my own subsistence, for, to bring fish home. But more, maybe more importantly now these days is to maintain that tradition of fishing, of going up to the mountains where my father or my elders fished before me. So uh, it's something that we got to carry on. And that's really why I fish. We got to pass that on to the, our children. We have to have that for them in order to be uh, Indians, in order to survive and carry on the things that were placed here for us, and carry on what our elders tell us and teach us. Mimi Aupu and Chimam and Chipush, the Wikushena, seven, 14, 21 generations ago, they thought of us as children. We hadn't arrived yet. They borrowed our language, they borrowed our religion, they borrowed our water, they borrowed the air, they borrowed the sunlight, all of these things in that harmony circle. They borrowed and they was instructed to leave it for us grandchildren. And they did leave it clean and pure and like that. So the instructions that we have, what we call Tamanwit law, we are to leave it seven 14 and 21 generations into the future. I was always taught that if you stay by the water and take that fish from the water, it'll always be in abundance. But if you leave it and you walk away from it, it will disappear. And we found ourselves by the water doing this, staying by the river and the salmon, and living our life as fishing people, as you'd say. The right to fish, I guess, as I understand from our elders, was a right that was given to us. The Creator put these fish here for the Indian people to fish. And so it was put here for us to live by. The salmon was, was brought up these rivers. There are stories, there's our history and our legends explain uh, why these salmon were here, why they came up to feed the people back even before there were human beings when the animals were here. So that is our right from the Creator. And it is a, a right that we try to maintain as human beings who were placed here by the Creator. That's where our right to fish comes from. And that's one of the things, again, of why we continue and try to maintain that, uh, our fishing in all these different places that we go. I don't feel like it's within our rights as the tribe that we are to go to a different area and live off of something that maybe God has, you know, blessed them with. This is our blessing. This is the way we see it. This is where we should stay. I don't believe that I would leave the area. I believe I would stay where I'm at, by the water. It's our lineage.
We are the land, we are the earth. Other people walk upon it and they are on the land. Except the Indian people, they are in the land and they come from the land and they're going back to the land. They are part of the land. The earliest material on the, on the Columbia Plateau dates to around 11,500 years ago or so. And then after that is material dating around between 10,800 and 9,800, and it's all over the place. Uh, these are actual places where there is no question of the existence of occupation, of the remains of human occupation, the remains of small campsites, small camps. What they indicate is that at that time, the people living in the, in the Columbia Plateau were very scattered. There weren't very many people. Uh, there were very highly mobile hunter and gatherers who moved probably on a seasonal round that covered a great deal of territory. In some of the small sites, there are at least small portions of salmon bone remains. These don't become really plentiful until a little before 7,000 years ago, maybe 8,000 years, something on that order, before the eruption of Mount Mazama and the deposit of Mazama ash that is a very good time marker through much of the plateau. The evidence for salmon consumption includes finding the fish themselves bones of the fish in places where they couldn't naturally have fetched up, you know, like along a stream bank or something where they die and the bones will accumulate there. So the earliest evidence for the fish themselves, finding the bones, is a site called the Five Mile Rapid Site, which is on, in, on the, near the Dalles in Oregon at the eastern end of the gorge. And there are, there are about 200,000 salmon vertebrae and deposits dating between about 10,000 and 9,000 years ago. It's a very massive number of fish. So then in terms of fishing equipment, the earliest evidence we have is for things like using fish spears with barbed points on them. Uh, fish spears as early as we have re record for people. But then very early, after, sometime after 10,000, between 10,000 and 7,000, we have evidence of net weights. As you go up the basin, everywhere there was some sort of constriction in the Columbia or in the major feeder streams, there is evidence of a, some prehistoric fishery. They seem to be dispersed throughout the entire basin. There isn't any doubt about that. Again, because there were, I think there were so few people, the sites are all very small. You just have small, small family size groups. The one at the Dalles could be different. When the first Indian people were living on the Columbia Plateau, there weren't very many people. What the salmon runs did was to permit very large groups to come together and other conditions where people would be able, therefore, to, to conduct other spiritual and, and social aspects of their lives. We know that people gather together annually or every so often to find marriage partners and to, to do what people need to do in groups, uh, sing and, you know, conduct religious ceremonies and just sit around and talk about what they've seen for the last several years. And I think what may have happened at the Dalles is that that was a place where people came because the fish were there. In other words, they weren't necessarily fishing for salmon for storage, because we don't have any evidence for storage that early. But say 8,000, 9,000 years ago when they would have these gatherings, they would come together at places like the Dalles or like Kettle Falls or some other place where the fish were easily caught and they could feed themselves with the fish and go about the rest of the business. And I think 
in that way that salmon might have become inextricably mixed with uh, the social and spiritual lives of Indian people because in a way it made possible the gatherings that those lives required. You can't be a social person, you can't be necessarily a spiritual person all the time by yourself. You've got to get together with 50, 60, 100 other people sometimes. Many archaeologists would place a real change at about 5,000 years ago when there comes to be increasing evidence of salmon remains. That's not the only thing people were using, you understand. About that time, you begin to get grinding stones with, that apparently were used with basket hoppers on top of them that might well have been for seeds, but they also could easily have been used to pound salmon into paste as we know it was stored and traded at the time the Europeans first arrived. The trade network was centered at the Dalles, was one of the was the hub, the western hub of a trade network that ran basically from the west coast to the east coast. It was connected, for example, with a lesser trade fair located near Boise, which had connections then up in what is Yellowstone, and then Yellowstone is linked down the Missouri system into the east. Um, so that, the, and then the trade ran up and down the coast, the west coast, up and down the coast, and up and down the east side of the Cascade. So it's, it's a continental-wide trade network. And in a lot of studies of obsidian indicate that obsidian was traded around the Pacific Northwest for at least 8,000 years, eight or 9,000 years, perhaps even longer. Obsidian, for example, from a major obsidian quarry outside of Boise has turned up on the Clearwater, has turned up in sites in the western part of the Columbia Plateau. An obsidian source in northern BC called Mount Adsiza is traded down into southern British Columbia. Obsidian source material from the Newberry Crater in, in Oregon turns up in southern BC and things. So that there's this, this volcanic glass which when it's chipped produces an edge which is the sharpest natural object that we know of. It's one molecule thick. So people wanted to get their hands on it and when we find it, we can locate where it came from. Another thing that we find are olivella shells and dentalium shells, which were used for beads. Olivella shells primarily perhaps came from the coast of California. Dentalium comes primarily perhaps from northern Vancouver Island. And we find those in sites on the plateau as early as, like at Marmus, as early as almost 11,000 years ago. So people on the plateau have been trading and connected with people on the coast for as long as we have archaeological uh, evidence for their having been here. At the time, by the time of Lewis and Clark, clearly salmon and the harvesting of salmon and the preparation of salmon for trade was uh, very important in the Dalles region, extremely important. Before we are released to go and gather the food and to take care of it in all the ways that we have been taught to make it into a, a product of, of trade and barter to gather other substances and food or whether we use it for our daily sustenance or as a staple to our diet which our people do. In observance of this order of creation and the laws of the Creator, at the time of the coming of the food, there is a very significant religious observance by our people that before we go out and gather these foods, that we must pay our respects and treat these foods in the manner that it was given to us. And so when we greet this food, we first must gather together and greet it with a count, what they call the counted words, the songs and the teachings are brought out and the food as it is now called when it becomes a food is laid out before the people and we have a first feast then. <laughs> Ka, 
ka hitsa ka ka hi pai taunik the importance of the first salmon ceremony has to do with the celebration of life of the salmon as subsistence meaning that the indians depend upon the salmon for their living and the annual celebration is just that uh, it's an appreciation that the salmon are coming back that it is again the the natural law the the cycle of life it's the way things are and if there was no water uh, there would be no salmon there would be no cycle there would be no food the indian people understand that cycle or understand nature and respect it accordingly Nobody can say, this is mine, or that is mine. Nobody can own anything on this earth, because it was created by somebody else. It was created by the Creator. It was created to benefit us, to take care of us. If we don't take care of things that are holy in ourselves, then we must face the consequences. All of you people, all different races of people that are here, heed my words. We should all love one another. We should all try to get along with each other or we'll be destroyed. The sacred salmon runs are in decline. It is the moral duty, therefore, of the Indian people of the Columbia River to see them restored. We have to take care of them so that they can take care of us. Entwined together inextricably, no less now than ever before, are the fates of both the salmon and the Indian people. The quest for salmon recovery is about restoring what is sacred to its sacred place. Nothing in nature is profane. <laughs>